I'm Eric Anderson. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, shut down for good. Southern California Edison says it will not seek approval to restart the San Onofre nuclear power plant. And instead, it will be shut down permanently. I'm Peggy Pico. Also ahead, he's been called the most corrupt congressman in America. Now Duke Cunningham is a free man. The backstory to his arrest and his plans for the future. Is someone listening to your phone conversation? President Barack Obama defends a federal program collecting phone records and monitoring Internet activity in the United States. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by Good evening, Dwayne Brown has the night off. Thanks for joining us. After being shut down for almost a year and a half, the San Onofre nuclear power plant is closing permanently. That news today from Southern California Edison, which runs the plant. It's been offline since January 2011, when a small radiation leak was detected in one of the tubes inside two newly installed steam generators. The problems continued as more tubes were found to have excessive wear, forcing the shutdown. Edison was pushing to restart at reduced power, but critics said it should never be restarted. Today, Edison said getting federal approval for the restart would take too long and cost the company too much money. Senator Barbara Boxer has been critical of how the company has disclosed its problems with the steam generators and their design. Today, she released a statement saying, in part, modifications to the San Onofre nuclear plant were unsafe and posed a danger to the 8 million people that live around here. And it is essential that this nuclear plant be safely decommissioned and does not become a continuing liability for the community. Southern California Edison has followed up their announcement to decommission San Onofre with some details. Peggy Pico joins us with our North County Bureau Chief. KPBS North County Bureau Chief Allison St. John has covered the story since it started a year and a half ago. She joins me now with the latest details on the decision to permanently close San Onofre. Allison, welcome. Tell us what's behind this decision. Well, this morning, Ted Craver, who is the CEO of Edison International, the parent company of Edison that operates the plant, said that the company basically had two options. Those, the option of shutting it down or the option of going with this application to restart one of the units at 70% power for five months. And they had this application in before the NRC. Last month, or a little over a month ago, Craver came out and told investors, look, if we don't get permission to start, restart the plant within the end of the year, we may have to decide to shut it down. And recently, there was a decision from the Atomic Licensing Board that suggested that maybe it was going to take a lot longer than they'd hoped. Um, the Atomic Licensing Board upheld a request from the Friends of the Earth for a public hearing. And if that had gone ahead, it would have been next year sometime before any decision. So they're and, cutting... And part, part of that decision about, I remember when that announcement was made a month ago, was about how much this was costing to just sort of be hanging on, correct? <laughs> Well, that's right. And, and in fact, what uh, Craver suggested was that the cost of keeping going was, was more than it was worth. So they decided to cut their losses. He said that it was costing them $800 million so far since January to just maintain and operate the plant in a condition where it could be restarted if that decision was made, and more than $500 million in order to find replacement power. So over a billion dollars just to kind of wait and see, and today they said we're done. So far, 1.3 billion, that's right. So they're cutting their losses by saying, let's pull the plug right now. Well, remind us of what caused this radiation leak in the first place and what caused everything to, to be shut down in the first place. Well, it all started with what was billed as a, a small radiation leak in one of the tubes of one of the steam generators, which had only just been replaced, actually, a year or a little over a year before that. And it turns out that the manufacturer of those steam generators, Mitsubishi, 
had had a faulty modeling uh, number in its computer system. So the thermal um, fluid elastic instability is the technical term for what happened as a result of this computer modeling error. And as a result, all the tubes, hundreds and hundreds of tubes, rattled more than they were supposed to, and some of them became dangerously thin. One of them actually ruptured, which was what caused that leak. The company had to plug hundreds of tubes, and the question was, could they fix it so that it would be safe, or would there be more ruptures in the future? Okay. And then, um, is Edison accepting any blame for what happened, or are they just tossing that back to Mitsubishi? Uh, well, uh, Mr. Craver did say, we, we questioned Mitsubishi back in 2004, 2005 about the design. We knew it was a big design change, um, but he's saying that if they had done any more than that, it would have been, like, intrusive, mm -hmm. so that he feels they did as much as they, they was warranted in terms of oversight. So he admits that the Edison is, in fact, the, the um, responsible party party, but, and they are going off to Mitsubishi for insurance money, but he is saying that the company did everything they could, and in fact, he says he doesn't really think it would have been caught if they had done any more oversight. That's what he said. Okay. What about the ramifications of this shutdown, permanently shutting down this? What's going to happen with the ratepayers? This is something we've talked about again and again. Well, <clears throat> we just talked about the $1.3 billion, and that is the amount that's on the table, although some people might add the $700 million that it costs to install those new steam generators which brings the figure up to more than $2 billion, which is what the ratepayers are on the hook for. And, of course, the California Public Utilities Commission right now is in the midst of an investigation. They're trying to nail down what exactly are the costs and is it reasonable to ask the ratepayers to pay for that. So this is going to be decommissioned. That's going to say, take some time. Tell us uh, what that's like and, and mm. what happens when you decommission the, a plant. Well, this is, as you say, not the end of the situation because, uh, first of all, they had to take the fuel out and put it into a cooling pond and then they'll put it into stainless steel casks and uh, Mr. Craver said that until the federal government makes a decision as to what to do with nuclear power nationwide they will stay on site. Um, the decommissioning fund that has been being collected ever since the plant opened is now at 2.7 billion dollars which sounds like a lot but apparently that's only 90 percent of what they estimate it will cost to completely decommission this plant. So there could be more cost to ratepayers if if it goes that direction. Well KPBS North County Bureau Chief Allison St. John, thank you so much. I want to let folks know that for more information or to comment on this story, you can go to our website. We have a special spot for you, kpbs.org slash San Onofre. Meanwhile, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, the company that built San Onofre's faulty steam generator, says it is disappointed by the decision to shut down the plant, and it believes that San Onofre could be operated safely and reliably. San Diego County, of course, made it through last summer without power from the nuclear power station. But what about this summer? We also have um, gotten additional uh, resources. We have um, initially had planned to work with the owners of the Encina power plant in Carlsbad, thinking that we would be able to uh, retire that plant in the near future, but we have reached a, a contract with them that will allow us to continue to receive power from that plant and buy us some time as we together as a region uh, figure out the best answer for the permanent loss of San Onofre. Donovan goes on to say that the utility is working to make sure they have enough power to meet customers' needs, and the utility will be on alert throughout the summer months. When San Onofre shut down 18 months ago, ratepayers continue to pick up the tab, which now stands at around $1.5 billion. Attorney Mike Aguirre says it's time for the Public Utilities Commission to address the issue. We're hopeful that the Public Utilities Commission will be sobered up now and be willing uh, to move to the forefront, and we're going to be filing paperwork to do that so that the ratepayers are not stuck with this bill. It's not fair to the ratepayers. They're totally innocent, they did nothing wrong, and they shouldn't have to pay for the mistakes that Southern Cal Edison made. California's Public Utilities Commission has not yet issued a timeline for when it's going to decide what's reasonable to charge ratepayers. News of the permanent shutdown has buoyed activists who fought long and hard against the plant. Former nuclear industry official Arnie Gunderson frequently serves as an expert witness for anti-nuclear groups, and he says this is an earthquake for an industry that was talking about a renaissance just a few years ago. Four nuclear plants have shut down in the last two months, forever. Three were shut down because of steam generator modifications that went wrong, one in Florida, two here. 
And the other one was shut down because of economics. It didn't make economic sense. Gunderson says the nation's nuclear plants are aging and getting more expensive to operate. He says the San Onofre shutdown can be laid squarely in the lap of Southern California Edison, not the Nuclear Regulatory Agency. If Edison had followed the rules, the NRC would have caught these problems. They would have asked the right questions, and the things that damaged the steam generators in there would never have occurred. Donna Gilmore got the news from an early morning phone call. I didn't believe it. I, 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 I could, could, you, could you repeat? I, I just was in disbelief. I, I thought we were in for a long fight, and, uh, uh, and, and I still am waiting for the other shoe. I still think, okay, well, until they decommission this thing, they could change their minds. Gilmore is still worried that plant safety will remain an issue. She says nuclear fuel will still be stored there. And she has a question about the cost. They promised us these $700 million steam generators would last 40 to 60 years. That's what we were told. Um, and with them failing in less than two years, we didn't, we didn't get what we paid for. So they need to give us our money back. Southern California Edison officials say the shutdown has cost the utility $1.3 billion since last January. That does not include the cost of replacing the generators. We have continuing coverage on this story, and you can find it at kpbs.org slash San Onofre. President Barack Obama defended the government's collection of millions of phone records and the monitoring of some Internet activity in the U.S. In his first comment since the programs were publicly revealed this week, Obama says no one is listening to your telephone calls. What uh, the intelligence community is doing is looking at phone numbers and durations of calls. They are not looking at people's names. And they're not looking at content. But by sifting through this so-called metadata, they may identify potential leads with respect to folks who might engage in terrorism. The president made his remarks on a swing through California today. The California serial killer known as the Night Stalker has died. Richard Ramirez died early today of natural causes. Now, for decades, he's been on death row awaiting execution for the deaths of 13 people. That killing spree terrorized Southern California in 1984 and 85. Ramirez entered homes through unlocked windows and doors and left satanic symbols at murder scenes. He even forced some of his victims to swear to Satan before he killed them. Palomar Health is planning to lay off 84 workers next month. They say it's due to Medicare reductions and sequestration cuts. The layoffs represent about 2% of the health provider's workforce and will include registered nurses, clerical workers, non-medical positions, as well as supervisors. Starting on Monday, no parking in Balboa Park's Plaza de Panama. That's when Mayor Bob Filner's plan for a car-free plaza is scheduled to begin. It replaces a larger scale proposal by Qualcomm co-founder Erwin Jacobs. Repaving of the area should be complete by mid-June. San Diego Central Library will close on Sunday. The building is home to more than two and a half million books, magazines, and DVDs. Now, the building has been in service for 58 years downtown. More than a century of collections will be moved to the library's new location. That's over on Park Boulevard. The new $185 million dome-topped building is scheduled to open for customers in September. A newsmaker who became famous and then infamous resurfaced this week. Former San Diego Congressman Randy Duke Cunningham completed his seven-year sentence and has moved out of a halfway house. Peggy Pico has more. 71-year-old Randy Duke Cunningham is a former Navy pilot and distinguished war veteran. His 15 years in Congress ended abruptly after he was convicted of conspiracy to commit bribery, mail and wire fraud and tax evasion. He accepted more than $2 million in bribes from defense contractors, earning him the title of the most corrupt congressman in America. My guest, journalist Dean Kalbreth, was part of the Union Tribune's Pulitzer Prize winning team, which exposed Cunningham's crimes and led to his arrest and conviction. Dean, welcome back. Hi, thanks. 
At his sentencing back in 2005, Cunningham wept and expressed remorse. But on his way out of court, you have said he didn't really say that was really the truth, right? Right, right. He, he, what we've heard is that out of the way, on the way out of court, he turned to the bailiff and he said, you know, they got this all wrong. And that his guilty plea was really a mistake, right? Uh, he has since said uh, that his guilty plea was, was a mistake, that he was talked into it by his lawyer. One of, remind us of the charges again. I, I rattled through some of them. But in, in general, this is, was about him, basically, the legality of him profiting as a congressman? Yeah, basically, um, you know, he oversaw the Pentagon budget, the CIA budget. Uh, he had two contractors, you know, and he was taking in a lot of political contributions from contractors contractors all over the country in order to uh, to advance their causes to the Pentagon. Uh, but this went beyond that. He uh, was taking gifts from two particular uh, contractors, one in Washington, one in Poway, gifts including a two and a half million dollar house uh, in Rancho Santa Fe, including a Rolls Royce, uh, fancy dinners, fancy vacations, a couple of prostitutes in Hawaii. Um, you know, it, it was a, a wide variety of things, 17th century commodes that you know and and multi-thousand dollar Persian rugs that he furnished the house with right so pretty extravagant and pretty visible it wasn't yes. like he was hiding these these gifts remind us of you were at the San Diego Union at the time that uh, you wrote this yes. uh, with, with a couple of other journalists uh, Marcus and uh, Jerry uh, what prompted you at the beginning what did you say uh, something's not right here. Was it the Rolls Royce or something else? Well, Marcus Stern, who is a reporter for us in Washington, D.C., uh, he um, was investigating Cunningham for, uh, was investigating all our local congressmen for something totally different, for uh, airplane rides that they had uh, taken, whether they had taken any. Cunningham had taken one, which is totally unrelated to this, but when he, he found out about that airplane ride, uh, paid for by a local contributor, um, he started looking at other things. And one of the things he looked at was his house. And he found out that his house had... In Del Mar. In, right. in Del Mar. Mm -hmm. He had found out that his house in Del Mar had been purchased at an extravagant price uh, by somebody who had sold it later, uh, six months later, at a major loss. Mm. Um, and this was at a time when uh, property in San Diego was not going down. So he... Um, um, uh, so Marcus followed this up and found out that this was a military contractor who had basically been had been kind of paying off Cunningham uh, with this uh, overage on the uh, house. Inflated a cell of his house, so that perked exactly. up your ears. And then it went on from there. He found a, a, a yacht, a small yacht that the um, congressman had purchased, I mean, that the uh, contractor had purchased, and it just went on and on. And on. Did you actually uh, talk to uh, Cunningham when you were doing this story? Did you tell him, hey, look, I've got this information. Will you talk to me? I talked to him. I talked to him um, uh, about, um, you know, I was talking to him about uh, military contracts as well, and he was happy to be answering those questions. Uh, I turned it to, the, to a free vacation that he had taken where he had wrecked an ATV that had been given to him by, by one of the bribers. Um, and uh, he answered a few questions on that, and then he said, uh, sorry, you got to talk to my lawyer. When you told him this is going to be published or when he knew finally that, look, this is turning into an investigation, did he ever respond and say... Wow, did I blow it? Did he tell you anything like that? No, he talked. Uh, his main conversation on the topic was with Mark Stern, uh, and he told Mark Stern that he had done um, some favors in Washington for one of the bribers. Uh, and to that, uh, you know, that constituted quid pro quo, which is the legal definition of bribery. Uh, uh, so Mark Stern wrote a story about that. That was the initial story, and that was uh, what got the federal prosecutors involved. Okay, got him going. Um, He's going to be on probation for three years. I understand that he might be moving to a, a cabin in Arkansas. Do you know anything else that he, his plans? Yeah. A year ago, he said he was going to move to a cabin in Arkansas near his 100-year-old mother and near his brother. Um, uh, you know, he said he would be hunting and fishing. But now it turns out, uh, it, more recently, he said he's going to go to Florida and be with um, some old Navy uh, colleagues. But uh, he's not coming back to San Diego. Okay. And we haven't heard anything for sure. Dean Calbert, thanks so much for uh, your work on this and for uh, giving us an update. Sure enough.
When the La Jolla Playhouse decided to stage the play His Girl Friday, they had to ask, how could they make a play about reporters in 1939 Chicago connect with an audience in San Diego today? KPBS arts reporter Beth Akamanda says the solution involves set design and lots of doors. Even at a dress rehearsal with actors in street clothes, the newsroom set for His Girl Friday immediately places you in a 1939 Chicago courthouse newsroom. It's kind of one of the fascinating things about sitting and, and, and looking at a space, even in advance of the actors getting on stage. It's, it feels like there's something that has happened prior to you walking in. For Robert Brill, a set must support and give life to the story. So we've created a very beautiful room, yet at the same time a very kind of dingy room where these reporters are have created their nest. It's a nest layered with the kind of meticulous details that can inspire actors like Jen Lyon and Douglas Sills. I this sleep here. I, I he sleep on stays, the table. I have my head on the keys of He's the typewriter. In I, it, everything changes. The way you sit in a chair, a wooden chair from this period, the way you hold the phone, the way you talk, all that stuff is informed by the reality of uh, you know, the tangible reality that they create for us, and it's incredibly... And La Jolla has done a fantastic job. I mean, down to the last detail, the crates, the stacks of newspapers, you have, like, old photos, you have ledgers, you have anything you could want to touch is just like... Uh, it transports you into this time period. It's it's fantastic. Lion plays Hildy Johnson to Sills' Walter Burns. Rogers and Hart, Fred and Ginger. Oh, Fred and Ginger! Too bad. She gave him sex, he gave her class. The play's inspired by both the 1928 play The Front Page and the 1940 screwball comedy His Girl Friday. And then John Guare took The Front Page and His Girl Friday and made what I think is a really smart decision is set it solidly on August 31st, 1939, the day basically everything kind of explodes in Poland and the Nazis start taking over. It's happening at this really potent historical moment, but none of the reporters are paying any attention to that. They're completely obsessed with the local news. The excitement's back. This hanging brings us back together. The reporters are frantically focused on a scheduled execution about to happen in the courtyard they can see out of their fourth story window. One of our first impulses, which I'm really glad that we stuck with, is we decided that this room should have a ceiling. Most of the time when you go to see a, a set for a play, there's no ceiling on it. And because we're up on the fourth floor and a lot of the light is from, from kind of deep below, four floors down, we built a ceiling on it so that like the shadows and the light up through the blinds creates a real sense of, of height and of an event lower down. Because most of the audience can see the ceiling, it makes them feel like they are looking into a complete space. And it's also just a really juicy space to block in. It's got incredible nooks and crannies and proportions. And doors. Usually Farce has a lot of doors. We do yeah, have a one, lot of doors. One, two, three, four. I'd have to look behind me at the set to see exactly how many doors there are on the set, but probably 11. This set does have a lot of doors and a lot of entrances and exits. Yeah, and the timing of everything is incredibly complicated in this play. The question of when is the door open, when is the door closed, when does it slam? You know, you learn about what works for comic timing and what doesn't, and how long does it take for them to get from one side of the stage to the other before another line is delivered. So much depends upon timing. Of upon doors. what? Upon timing. Timing? So, <laughs> please. <laughs> a well-placed entrance can make or break a line. Making sure that the, your, the audience eye is at the right place on stage is really crucial to it being funny to them. The ballet of the screwball comedy is incredibly complicated and very fun to work out. There's a real science to that as well as an art. The art of Robert Brill's set is that it captures both the comic and the serious elements of the play, which is exactly what Ashley wants. So there's this kind of dark underbelly and this very um, fun screwball comedy surface. So with this, it, it has a light frothy top, but with a beef stew bottom. <laughs> I love about this play that it's a real mix of the light, the romantic, and real substance. It's a play with teeth. The bite comes from the fact that although the technology of delivering the news has changed, the notion that truth often gets sacrificed for spin remains the same. These reporters aren't truth tellers, they're storytellers. Ashley's a storyteller too. And he hopes his girl Friday will spin a story that's relevant to San Diego theater goers. Beth Accomando, KPBS News. Now the La Jolla Playhouse production, His Girl Friday, is due to run through June 30th.
I'm Judy Woodruff. On the next news hour, Margaret Warner reports on the growing divide in Lebanon over the Syrian civil war. That's Friday on the PBS News Hour. Clouds along the coast only uh, reaching in the high 60s. The clouds are going to continue inland, but uh, higher temperatures are on the way. Partly sunny in the mountains. Look for temperatures around 85 tomorrow and then triple digit temperatures and lots of sunshine out in the desert areas. Hello. I want to tell you a little bit about the investment KPBS has made in bringing you the news. From investigations into the Port of San Diego, whooping cough, San Diego Hospice, San Onofre, and North County Transit, our news team in association with iNews Source is proving time and again that we don't stop after day one. We follow the issues that matter to our citizens and keep you up to date on the new developments. In order to achieve this, KPBS has invested in growing our news team on all platforms. You can access KPBS News anytime and anywhere you want. But we couldn't make any of this investment without your support. Become a member today and consider yourself part of the KPBS team. Thanks. Recapping tonight's top story, the San Onofre nuclear power plant is shutting down for good. Southern California Edison, which runs the plant, made the decision not to seek a restart from federal regulators. The utility had been working to restart under partial power, but they decided it was too expensive. You can find tonight's stories and download the KPBS app all on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks very much for joining us. Have a great evening.